On this episode of Pickridge's Brain, I have the iconic Devin O'Day radio host, author, songwriter, motivational speaker as my guest, and we talk about multitasking at the highest level, doing what you love every single day, and the great things that happen over coffee. Amen. Drummer, percussionist, author, composer, songwriter, producer, professional speaker, actor, Rich Redmond has left his mark on thousands of songs, including over 21 number one hits over 30 years. Of been there, done that, wisdom and knowledge in the Nashville music business. This is Pick Rich's Brain. What's up, everyone? Rich Redman here, coming from Crash Studios, Nashville, Tennessee. We got a major, major treat for you today. The iconic radio host, songwriter, author, speaker, Devin <laughs> O'Day is here. How are you? Hi, baby. How are Thank you? you so much for coming here on kind of like a dreary Saturday. But you're um, like sunshine. See, all the drear goes away when well, I'm sitting next you. to you. Well, we always have such a good time. And, you yeah. know, you have had me on your show two, three times. Thank yeah. you so much. You're so well. great at what you do. And having you here today is great because our co-host, our Ed McMahon, my Ew. sidekick, Jim McCarthy. Jim McCarthy voiceovers is in the house. Yay. And uh, we talk about this idea of, of, uh, of being a poly-talent. What's the word, Jim? Multi-potential. A multi-talent or multi-potentialite, which is the idea. We're hyphies. You yeah. do so many things, and you do so many things at a high level. Um, you're an I iconic radio personality. Oh, thank you do you. voiceover. You've done um, commercials. You're an ex model. You've written four books. Um, you're a, a hit songwriter. So this is just really just exciting. We could talk about all these things today because here on Pick Rich's Brain, we talk about all things music, motivation, and success. Awesome. So I love that. I don't even know where to start. Maybe, you know, this is what every podcaster does. Well, tell us a little about where you're from. You're from Louisiana. Right? I absolutely. And then how you got yeah. into doing what you're doing. Yeah. You know what? My mom gave me a choice. I, you know, I was, you know, you're 17 years old. It's summer vacation, and you think I'm going to sleep late. I'm going to. My mom said, "Uh, uh, you're 17 years old. You can have a job. You can toss burgers. You can babysit. You got to have a job right now. Get out there." And I went to the radio station, and they said, "Can you type?" And I said, "Yeah." Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I can. And that's what got me in. So you started. It's almost like. Uh, you know, you hear these stories of famous producers. They started out sweeping the floor and going to run for coffee. Yeah. They said, can you type? And it was typing advertising copy. There weren't computers. Right. It was 1976, and there weren't computers. So I was at an IBM Selectric typing copy. They said, can you write copy? Yes. And then that weekend, they said, hey, would you like to come work overnights on the radio? The jock came in, and as many people in the business, there was some old geezer that said, you, you, this is a mic. This is how you cue a record. And I'm going to go to outside and smoke. And I said, You're smoking now. Right, he yeah. does it. And he never came back. <laughs> That's my first night on radio. Wow. And it was within 48 hours of my being hired to type. That was like uh, Mark Wahlberg, you know, passing the torch in the movie Rockstar. Yeah. He said, I'm, I'm going for, he said, I'm going for a pee. And yeah. He, and he never came back. Yeah. Um, so that's really funny in 1976, because that's when I got my Blue Sparkle snare drum and started playing the drums. No kidding. Yeah. So we were kind of like launching our yeah. life path at the same year. Isn't that something? Very, very cool. It was. It started everything for me. And I was just this kid around. And I was eaten up with radio and music. And I read every liner note. That's right. back when we were playing 45s, but they had albums. And I learned very quickly in a Bible Belt town not to play the live version of Devil Went Down to Georgia. <laughs> oh, because the of album. the son of a... Yeah, yeah uh-huh. Gotcha. Yeah. I just played Devil Went Down to Georgia in Hollywood the other night. It was really funny. There's this jam session at the... Um, what's the... Uh, not the, the whiskey. Yeah. And it's every Tuesday night. And so I went down there and they said, Rich, you're playing Devil Went Down. I said, I gotta come all the way to Hollywood to play country music. And they're like... You're the only guy that can get the right feel on this thing, man. <laughs> you're the you're I, was, it. I was like, okay, I go all the way to Hollywood to play. You're you know, a country guy. To play with a fiddle player. Yeah. Um, of course, they call them violin players out there. Yeah. It's not a fiddle player. Um, so your journey had started, and then uh, you, did you go to? You went to college. I went to college, Northeast yeah. Louisiana University, mm -hmm. now University of Louis, Louisiana Monroe. Yeah. None of my my sweatshirts are all out of date now. Yeah. 
There's like nothing exists. Tim McGraw and I went to the same college. We wow. were in the same jazz choir. Have they had you? Have they had you back to speak or to? Yes, okay. I've been back several times okay, to great. speak. Yeah, and uh, I traveled with the jazz choir. Graduated. Uh, Kim and I, Tim and I, both were kicked out of the same jazz choir too. <laughs> Why were you guys kicked out? <laughs> well, we wanted country music. That's you know oh, you gotcha. you know. But I did have that study and that basis in jazz, so that's why singing harmonies is so easy. Yeah. Because once you get out of singing a note. And a Manhattan transfer score for a thirteenth chord. Yeah, you know you can sing anything That's else. That's extension. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and then I graduated. I moved to New York. My little sister Faith Ford, who's an actress, she was already in New York. She right. she did not go to college. She won the Teen Model Search for Teen Magazine. Okay. She won that. Ended up in New York. I moved in with her. You guys are both models. Yeah. Well, here's how it is. I went to be an actress. Took a few acting classes and said, I hate this. And 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 said I I and then went to Ford Models and became the first plus size model. Oh. My sister went to be a model for Elite, and she took her first thing and they everybody laughed at everything she did. She said I'm a comedian, and then she started her her and, launch into acting. And Murphy Brown, the long the, the, and Murphy Brown, which is coming back in coming 2018. Back. I know we were yes. just talking about that. Yeah, it's very exciting. I was scouring the IMDb. Um, yeah, I remember that Candace Bergen. I mean, she, and she's she's going to be in the role. She's they're talking about it. Candace is the one that. Yeah, I mean, it, you got to have her. You got to have you got to have Murphy. Yeah, got to have Murphy. I don't know what is going to happen with this show, but I know it's a perfect time for it. I mean, if there's ever a time when both sides of the fence deserve a little laughter, yeah. it's now. Both yeah, sides, yeah. right? And, and this is the <laughs> this is the golden age of television. There is so much quality programming. Thank you, Netflix. Yeah. It's like I mean, I have Netflix on. I just was been binging on comedians and coffee getting car. Uh, get, oh, cars getting cars, coffee. Cars, car, car. Yeah. That's my favorite. I just love it. I can't stop watching. And what a great premise! It's like in and out, and and if for coffee lovers, it's like crack because you the steam is rising and the the French press and they're grinding the beans and two really funny people are are sharing my favorite beverage. I know, right. me too. And how many times? I mean, I'm going. It's at night, and I have to go have coffee because it's like Pavlov. It's like I go, a, <laughs> I gotta yeah, right? have some right now. I know, I've got to wait till yeah. the morning. Yeah, yeah it's, looks, it's like a coffee commercial. Yeah, it is a coffee commercial. You know, yeah. and then all of a sudden you got it. You know, yeah. I and then I go and and if I don't have any, I've just got to go like right then and go buy new. Yeah, you know, favorite coffee. Uh, well, I, I'm at Starbucks a lot, you know, just mm -hmm. because it's so consistent. Yeah. Um, but I do like the, you know, mom and pop coffee shops, and I will never pass up a, a French press. Um, uh -huh. But I do find that I drink a lot of iced coffee, especially the more time I spend in Los Angeles because it's sunny and 70 every day. Yeah. And it's just, and I can drink it with a straw, which is better for your teeth, you know. Yeah. So you don't have to whiten as much, you know. I don't know how Mario Lopez does it. Yeah. I, every time I go to the dentist, I'm like, give me Mario teeth. You're like, it's impossible. <laughs> He's not a human. Uh, so you, so you were studying uh, acting and voice acting. Yeah, I went to New York. I studied that, and I really loved it. Don Cobiella was my coach. Don Cobiella is tonight on MTV, the very first voice of MTV. Wow! And I loved him so much, and he gave me so much great advice. You know, he said, "Okay, the first sign of an amateur as a voiceover person is to do a character reel." And so I can do lots of accents. Mm. You can spot anybody coming in because you're never asked to do yeah. that. Uh, you, you know, if you can do one, keep that in your pocket. Yeah. Just have a great, good voice and, and put together what you sound like as a natural voice. Yeah. You know. So I studied, well, J Jim has, has been a teacher. And then I went and I took uh, classes with a guy named Eric Stewart who does yeah. all these uh, at Japanese animes. And mm -hmm. so he crushes all these characters in anime and he does all the conventions and stuff. So we did the typical, you know, the Target ad, the the ad with the with the crazy woman, um, yeah. the, the car commercial, you know, 2.5% MPR financing, you know, yeah. that whole thing. I was got pretty good at that. And um, I just auditioned to do the Hardy's, uh, the, the voice of Hardy's, which was a really cool That would be a great one for you. Because it was like, the new Hardy's thick burger. Yeah. So <clears throat> thick. Yeah. Um, but, you know, no news is no news. I didn't get the job. Um, but, you know, I'm in the game. It feels good. You're in you know? the game. You you never, you're 100% guaranteed not to get the job if you don't audition. You've got to try. Mm -hmm. You and, do. And, and, and acting and voice acting is totally based, of course, relationships. Relationships help get, help get in the room. Your team helps you get in the room. But it's it's all audition based, mm -hmm. which is in the music business, I feel like at some point it used to be audition based. And I get so many messages from people saying, hey, keep me in mind for auditions. Or, 
I can't remember the last time there was an audition for a musical act in Nashville. It is so relationship based because the mm -hmm. expectation is that you're going to be able to play, that you're great at your craft. Mm -hmm. It's like who do we who's got the right look and who do we want to hang out with for twenty three hours a day? It's relationship. It really you know? is relationship. But I wish I kinda of wish it was like that in acting. You know, because yeah. I can crash a party. But but it's so <laughs> audition based. Oh my god. It is, but there's a certain amount of relationship to it as you start. You'll you'll figure out because there are people you know, sometimes it's the relationship of your agent to the casting director. The casting director, yeah. You know, sometimes, hey, I got a guy. Hey, work with my guy. Yeah. Or, you know, and so there's there's a little bit of that. And people who like spending time with you. Mm -hmm. Nobody, I don't care what they say. There might be some divas on some stages and some, you know. But as a general rule, nobody loves working with a diva. If they can find, if they can find people they like to work with. Yeah. The higher the lesser actor, that's a nicer guy. Right or yeah. you know what I mean that you like to yeah. be around. I mean, every time I put a team together for people, I go like, "Well, this guy is incredible, but he is difficult. Let's go with this guy." You know, yeah. let's wrap a band around that that bass player yeah. or whatever. But yeah, yeah. how do you go about telling people that though? Like actually having a did. conversation. <laughs> I mean, you know, somebody who's typically if they're good for the job, but it's yeah. like you know have them come to Jesus and asking them. Dude, you gotta, you know. I talked to someone one time. She kept saying, why is it I don't get hired back? And I said, just remember the customer is always right. Mm -hmm. And she said, what do you mean? I said, you complain every time you are. You argue with your director every time. Oh, That's why they're not. She said, but, but, well, if I gave a great cut, why should I listen to them? I said, because they're paying. They're signing the check. Yeah. You know, that's the deal is that if you know, if you're working with a producer and they say, take it again, you don't go, but that was really good. <laughs> that was it. That was it. I will not do it again. No, yeah. you would never tell your act that you work for that. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Just knowing how to read the, read the room. I mean, today I did this. Uh, it was a really fun session uh, for the Make a Wish Foundation. Oh, awesome! Um, There's this young young uh, girl named uh, Gwendolyn, and her parents came in, and uh, Gwendolyn is not going to live. They know that. Oh. So the parents wanted to memorialize her with a with a song that'll exist in their family forever and ever. Wow. So you know we got. We had Chris Lusinger and Spady Brennan mm -hmm. and, and Jimmy Nichols, and it's like these guys know what we're do they're doing. So I said, guys, let's not overthink this. Let's just we could talk it to death. We got in there, and it was just like the collective of that talent. It just, it just happened. Only, only in Nashville, really, it really, really it spoils is. It, you. The process is so streamlined. Mm -hmm. We know what to do. That just doesn't happen in other cities. No. I did see something amazing happen in Sydney, Nova Scotia. And I know that seems odd. Pam Tillis was there, as was I. I was there. We were there for a Christmas Daddy's Telethon. And there were these kids. They were all Celtic. They came out of the mountains there in the Newfoundland area. Yeah. You know, they came down uh, and they were all Scottish descent. And she said... You're my band because they all looked like they were twelve, mm. and they said, "Yeah." They said, well, what songs do you know? They said, "All of them." All of hers. All of them, Miss Tillis. We know all of your songs. They had memorized and learned every song with this wonderful. And she said, "Which was your favorite?" They said, "A song called Melancholy Child," an album cut on one of her first albums, wow. and it was astounding. And she turned around. I mean, I she got tears in her eyes. Got so there, there's these magic pockets. Yeah. And she said, how did you get so good? She, they said, there's nothing else to do. <laughs> and so there's some good things I about growing it. up in nowhere areas in the world oh, where yeah. everybody's talented. Oh, you know, know what? Like uh, growing up in El Paso, Texas, going, mm -hmm. going to uh, school in Lubbock, Texas, nothing to do. Uh -huh. it's, you're, in, you're in the southwest Texas, tumbleweeds. Tumbleweeds everywhere. Oh, yeah. Then, oh, yeah. In college, I just practiced and practiced and practiced. So by the time I was, got to Dallas, I was like, okay, I got my skill set. Now I just got to figure out how to get gigs. But speaking of Pam Tillis, you know, that was my first marquee job in Nashville. That was based on audition. Um, but the previous drummer called and said, hire Rich. And so they put in a good word for me. And I, Pam and I hit it off. And we worked together two and a half years. Um, you wrote songs for Pam, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, and I got to sing with her. There was a festival that used to be, I sang backgrounds with uh, with her. We, I was singing at Summer Lights. And, yeah. you know, the big festival. And yeah. we went down and I go, and how many times do you get to sing background vocals with Pam Tillis as the other part? She sang the high harmony. I sang the low harmony. It was awesome. Yeah. Um, wrote a song, uh, I co-wrote a song um, called Space. And it wasn't released as a single, but it was on a Thunder and Roses CD. And 
But it got chosen to go on this Women of Country Music you Raisin know, Brand box. I know so space. I guess, I, I, we played space. Yeah. Yeah. You were, okay. Boom. Boom. Now, as far as some, <laughs> like, let's look at some of these other people you've written songs for. Um, Leanne Womack, Hank Williams Jr., Pam Tills, Neil McCoy, Trace Adkins. So are mm. you just in the, in, a game, in the game where you're just writing all the time and you're, you know these people, so you're personally pitching or you're writing with them or do you have a plugger or how does that work? I personally pitch, but I don't personally pitch to the artist unless I can. If I can, believe me. You know, as as Alan Jackson will tell you, Devin will show up at your doorstep and uh, hang something with a big bow on the front gate. Not recommended. That didn't work. But I will say that George Strait, I just, I took it to Irv Woolsey's office, the management office. There was an overflowing box of uh, pitches. pitches. And I just put mine on, on there, you know, yeah. and I got a phone call that week. That's, awesome. that's interesting that there's an overflow pile of pitches. How do you make yours stand out? Because that's like in radio, uh -huh. you open up an air shift, you get inundated with demo tapes mm -hmm. and people all around the country, but you get those people that really know how to stand out together. Well, she, she, she stands yeah. out because you they know you as a radio personality, yeah. right? I had so. my name on there, so maybe that helped because yeah. <laughs> it had a name, but, 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 you know, but it's still in a box full. I mean, they don't see a name in a box full. You know, well, now be, that, now that from what you could see in those boxes, can can you see other people that try and differentiate? Look, yeah, but they probably know. knew everybody in that box. Now Here's that box the deal. Is in here. Yeah, it's that little bites and for the Y bites. But yeah. that's actually not a, a bad tactic to do it the analog way. Yeah, you know what? Well, no, here's the deal. No one has CD players anymore. I, I People say, here, this is my new solo record, and they give me a CD. They go, I don't have one in my car. I don't have one in my computer. Yeah. I don't have one. That's very true. That's true. That's <laughs> weird. You have to, but, but you know, you find a way, the easiest way to get to that person. And maybe it's not CDs anymore. Maybe it's finding a person that you can email something to. Um, they're great services, you know. Um, m between Music Row, Taxi, uh, there's some other, there's some places that, that can kind of connect you yeah. uh, that way. Sometimes, again, the relationships. So with all these different things that you're doing, um, people always ask me, like, okay, so you're wearing all these different hats under this big entertainment um, under, umbrella. How do you decide when you're going to do what? So, like, you're hosting radio shows, you're going to work at WSM, you're, you're doing voiceover, you're recording for Audible, people's books. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe I just answered the question you, that you just you're you're doing what lands on the le that needs to be done that day, right? Yeah, and my word for the year. I mean, I don't do resolutions. I do word for the year, and my word for this year is structure. You know, you live your life, and there are moments in your life when you go, "I am just breaking free or whatever." But I find if I really structure my day, I get more done. Mm -hmm. And so I literally have a whiteboard every day it's on my refrigerator and, you go I, and I and I write it down and I say okay you know animals are taken care of got up in the morning did my my focus I do focus every morning you know whether it you know it's all it's meditation mindfulness yeah mindfulness and and uh, mine is scripture and I always read my scripture and I have this great book called Jesus Calling that I kind of it just seems to work for every day and then I, I go. I move really quickly into okay. I've got to do something creative. I got to move. I got to move my body. Okay. I, then I get right into the radio show. Make sure all my bookings are taken yeah. care of. If I've got a session that day, I've already put in four hours of work. Yeah. Before I leave for a nine thirty session. Oh my God! So you're up at five. Yeah, I'm usually up really really early. <sighs> you know, and because I like to start my day slowly. I like yes. Yeah, so a lot of times I was out of bed today. Boom! It was rip roaring. Got to go get drum sounds. Yeah, you know, you, know, just, you get that. The, yeah. There are the fast days. But if I can just get that cup of coffee and my sunshine yellow mug, it's like my. It's like okay, it's all right. It's gonna all be good. I'm so glad you drink coffee because I am. When my parents quit coffee, they went to tea. I said, "You guys quit." Oh, quit the club, <laughs> the aroma, the ritual, the the everything about yes, it is just yes. incredible. We love you, Juan Valdez. Um, yeah. Okay, so tell us a little bit about your 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 author. You're an author of, of My Southern Food, My Angels Wear Fur, and there's two mm. other titles, right? Yeah, yeah, and and some ghost titles that I've written that nobody knows, oh, and okay. I don't talk about. You know, I won't mention that I wrote a so book. These are you know, biopics. With, no, no. Um, well, it's, some of them were gift books. Books and you know, I just I've worked with different people. I got to work uh, kind of behind the scenes with Tony Orlando for oh, a gift hmm. book for Taya Yellow Ribbon, oh. and so that was a real gift, you know. And he's it was so sweet. Tony 
uh, called and said, you probably don't even know who I am. And I said, Tony, I carried your picture in my wallet in high school. Mm. I said, of course I know who you are. <laughs> I said, I love everything that you've ever done. Yeah. And, and I said, this is such an honor. You know, and had they not paid me, I would have still done it and loved it and right. been just like, ah. Writing is what I always wanted to do. I started writing when I was in first grade. I was writing stories. I was getting things published in the school newspaper. Yeah. And so I always wanted to write. And I studied writing when I went to New York City. I went to NYU while I was modeling and studied under authors. Study under people who do what you do. Find the professionals that you admire and get in touch with them. You can always do that. Yeah. If you look at Nashville, you see who cuts the records, and you go, I can meet Rich Redman. Study under somebody who's doing what you want. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Model yourself after them. And if you yeah. can, go have a conversation with them. Take them out for coffee or whatever. And like, they're every, the pros are more accessible than you would think. Yeah. You know, that's interesting. I didn't. We talk about mentorship, you mm-hmm. know. And I, and I, I was kind of thick-headed. When I came to town, I just said, you know what? I don't care how long it takes. I have a voice. I have something to say. I'm just going to hold <laughs> the course. But, you know, some people were super, super uh, supportive. Like, you know, Eddie Bears, Lonnie mm-hmm. Wilson. Oh, of course. You yeah. know, they were so helpful. And they were like, welcome to town, kid. You sound great. Go out there. Just shake hands and get involved and get get going. Like, start. Right. Uh-huh. You know, which is the, the it was the advice I gave everyone right now. Like, go mm-hmm. play, go play, go play your instrument. So, listening to your history, uh, you've always subscribed to the idea of doing several things. Yeah, and well, because I, when I was growing up, my mom also, other than making me get a job <laughs> and say do radio or whatever, um, she took me to the library, and I just. I was going through books. Of blah, blah, blah. She, I discovered biographies. She put biographies in my hand. I started re- just reading every biography, and I still do that to this day. Yeah. And I saw uh, another person who does that is Andy Andrews, who wrote The Traveler's Gift. He yeah. studied, you know, and you read these biographies of people who are f- successful, and they have common denominators and pretty soon those common denominators became mine Mm. it's so funny to read somebody else had done that very same thing when I read Andy Andrews uh, the way he does things of course 100 biographies in a year and all of a sudden you go oh yeah there is a common denominator for successful people successful people renaissance people I was fascinated with Leonardo da Vinci Mm. I thought you mean can do that People like Leonardo da Vinci, and I looked at Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton, uh, her birthday is the day after mine. Mm. And she does a lot. So I was watching what she did. I wanted to be Dolly when I grew up. I would watch Porter Wagner show, sing into a jump rope, sitting on, you know, standing on the ottoman. Mm. I loved her, and I patterned my life course. Hers, her biography, literally, it's, it's all marked up with me. I've highlighted. And, but you know her now, right? But I know her now. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. She's no different. She's still that person who says, I'm going to do what I was called to do. If you feel a divine calling to do anything, yes. you should do that thing. Yes. Or it will not let you go. It mm. won't let you go. I want to people re- think you're crazy. Mm. Yeah. Don't listen to them. <laughs> and don't here's another thing. Kevin Costner also he was born on my birthday. Okay. And so what Kevin says, when you have something that you want to do, don't tell anyone. Because if you tell people what you're going to do, they'll tell you every reason why it won't work. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. if you go ahead and do it, those same people will be lined up going, how did you do that? Mm. And interesting. So uh, I like that idea because I'm a doer. I like to do. But also Mm -hmm. there's a philosophy of of enlisting help from your friends. Mm -hmm. Say, this is what I'm trying to accomplish. That's how I ended up coming to Nashville because I said, it is time for me to get out of Dallas, Texas. There's a glass ceiling here so thick. I need... I, I want to hear myself on the radio. I want to see the world on someone else's dime. Um, it's not going to happen in Dallas, Texas. I need to move to New York or L.A. I started asking around. Does anybody know who's looking for a drummer on a national level? Well, my friend mm-hmm. goes, Trisha Yearwood. And I flew to Nashville there you to go. audition with Trisha Yearwood. Trisha Yearwood's band hooked me up with an audition for um, Dina Carter. And Dina Carter's band hooked me up with an audition for Barbara Mandrell. And I didn't get any one of those gigs, even though they liked my playing, because they said, Kid, where do you live? I said, Dallas, Texas. I should have said Nashville, Tennessee. Because that was the defining... They were like, man, we, we, we need you to live here. I, I would have moved. But there was something about the fact that I... Nashville is very particular about, are you in the club? Are you committed enough to be here mm-hmm. must be present to win so that's what I did is like, I moved here you have to be here gotta be here 
you know. But I, 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 yeah, I enlisted the help of a friend, and that's what got yeah, me here. Yeah, enlisting a help is different than going to everyone and telling them what you want oh, to yeah, do. Gotcha. See, because I've had a lot of help, and I, you know, I, I was not afraid to ask people. I met Barry Beckett from Muscle Shoals, yeah. greatest producer ever. And I met Mark. Yeah. 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 And I met Barry before I even knew who he was, what he did, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, I need to meet people. I just moved here. Now, who knew I was going to be sitting across the table with Barry Beckett with a cup of coffee? I didn't know. Yeah. And he said, hey, well, let me introduce you to Poopy. Nice. My first real recording, my first pitch meeting was with Barry Beckett. Wow. You went right to the top. I, See, good things happen over coffee. Good things happen over coffee. <laughs> and I pitched him a song, and it ended up being a single for Hank Williams Jr. There you go. Yeah, there he is right there. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Okay, so all these books, are they're still, they're still for sale? They're at, the at, at, at Amazon. You, you okay, just go Amazon. to Amazon. That's the easiest way. Everyone's like, Where's your, where, where do you sell your stick? And I was like, dude, just go to Amazon. Cool. Everything's at Amazon. <laughs> you know, go to Amazon, you know, and no matter what publisher I'm with, and, and even if you self-publish, find a way to be on Amazon. Yes. No matter what you do, be on Amazon because, you know, somebody in their underwear at midnight is going to be ordering it. Oh, my God, all my cellar food. <laughs> purchase. <laughs> uh, purchase. This is such a great conversation. It's so rich. I'm, yeah. just, I'm just inspired. Um, rich conversation. Do we get Oh, it's a rich sh- conversation. Sh- sh- um, do we have awesome. any cool questions? Uh, yeah, From, uh, the I'm face, actually um, the book of face. You know, we have we have a lot in common with radio and everything, and with your writing background, storytelling, and mm-hmm. with bi- biographies. Did that? Did you do a lot of advertising, copywriting? Yes. Oh, that's did my. That help you? Oh yes, because it. You know, no matter what you write, whether it's a song at three and a half minutes, whether it's a thirty second spot, whether it's a ten second spot, it's all a story. Mm-hmm. And the only thing that's different is a melody and the length. Wow. So if there, it doesn't have a melody, your chances are you're writing a, a, a prose mm-hmm. or copy. Well, there's a melody to your there's a melody to your copy though. The way yeah. you the way oh, you read. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Are you a big fan of Roy H. Williams? Do you know who he is? Wizard of Ads. No, I don't know that. Really? Yeah. I know. Look at I've actually been listening to his podcast it's called The Wizard of Ads. He does the Monday morning memo. Big. Oh, a new thing to listen yeah, to. Yeah, good stuff. Really good yeah. stuff. Yeah. But he's, um, yeah, he talks about a lot of that with the, the rhythmic foundations of storytelling and making things balance and stuff like that uh-huh. in ads. And See, voiceover artist, hobbyist drummer. See, he has the rhythm. I haven't, yeah, I do, but I haven't played very much lately. Well, I know. Yeah. Don't, don't give it up. I'm if you man. quit the drums, folks, you're going to be very Your drums will quit you. My, yeah. divine, <laughs> my divine calling will annoy the crap out of me. Yeah. When a lot of people checking in. You know, Carol Bonds, uh, Jonathan Yarbrough, I think you know him. Yeah, Jonathan, yeah. Tori Dent McDonald. Of course, Tori. Hey, Tori. Um, <clears throat> making your way from, uh, you just start with uh, modeling, then music, songwriting, and then getting to radio? Uh, I was in radio first, mm-hmm. moved to New York, mm-hmm. uh, and I, I, I had a little bit of, I was starting to get a little bit of success as far as acting, as far as, I was the only white person in this Harlem uh, theater troupe. Cool. They didn't. Get, they didn't get their funding, but I auditioned, and everybody else was auditioning, and their voices were so beautiful. It was the the years of Porgy and Bess, and mm-hmm. so they walked in into Old Man Rivard. I mean, mm-hmm. and the windows in this audition hall were yeah. shaking. I go, okay, not going to compete with that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So always the comedian. I pulled a puppet out, and I did a song from The Wiz with a puppet. And every time there was a speaky part that was a little bit higher for me, uh, the I would do something funny with the puppet. Wow. So I sang the whole, but they liked that I was able to improv comedy. And so that's how I got in. And, uh, but I walked in, I saw something on 60 Minutes about plus size models. I was a size 12 at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, And I walked in and they said, you're all American. And I said, what do you mean? They said, we're starting today's woman at Ford. And they said, we need someone. I said, first of all, will you cut your hair? And I went, I've never had short hair a day in my life. And okay. So I walked in, they, they sent me to this place, and on one side, Gloria Steinem was getting our hair done. Right. And ne- the other side oh, was... the celebrity? J- Jacqueline Onassis. Wow. Oh, wow. And I looked and I went, <laughs> and thank the Lord I wasn't paying that bill. It was just probably a $400 haircut in the 70s. Oh, ch- oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Very much so. And Eileen Ford wrote the check. So she, she, it was like I was one of her girls. Wow. I was the very first blonde. Emmy was the one who took my place. She was the all-American blonde. And after me, 
Emmy then went into television and has the greatest story ever. And people say, do you ever resent that? I said, no, I knocked the do- door down for her. Yeah. I said, I was the first one. And it was awesome. And I got to work for J.C. Penney and Montgomery Wards and Sears and Catherine mm-hmm. Stout. And I did covers. And I did it as a plus-size model. Yeah. The first. The very first That's amazing. blonde. The yeah. first All-American. And then uh, Patty was one of the original Marvelettes. She was the ethnic. Mm-hmm. And then we had uh, a, a redhead from Mississippi. She was a former Miss Mississippi. No. And uh, then Carol Alt's sister. And I can't think of what her first name is, but she was the brunette with the uh, blue eyes. And so it, we were the force from Ford, and we did everything. You know, I worked all the time. Did you like living in New York? I loved it. The, isn't it? I loved it's it. just a thing where it's, if I wish, it seems like I'm, I feel like I'm running out of time, but I almost feel like, God, I wish I could just live in New York for a while, you know, but there, I, I like West, you know, I like the palm trees and, and all that. That's yeah. where I'm putting my attention, but. God, wouldn't it be a different America if everybody lived in New York for a little while and for a little bit? That? I think if you can do that at least once, do it when uh, yeah. you know when you can. Just find that little car about that little time, even if it's six months. Yeah, it'll change the way you think. I didn't have a car. I learned what it was like to depend on everybody else to get somewhere, mm-hmm. and you know, I walked six miles a day. You yeah. know, because I walked everywhere. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, you learn how to live smaller. Tighter. Tighter. Share a bathroom in the hallway with someone. <laughs> yeah. You know, it really is a different way of life. And I learned so much. And I learned to pay attention to people. Yeah. And I learned when feel, when, if something feels dangerous, I'm out. I, I've mm-hmm. learned that in, and, and, and New York taught me that. It you was, mean as far as like uh, being able to read a room and, and, yeah. and being situationally aware, situationally. Uh-huh. If, and, you know, and, I, and there's some situations I will never put myself in. Mm-hmm. And I, there's never a situation where I don't know everybody around me. I take stock of everybody in the room. I learned that in New York. Yeah. Because New Yorkers will teach you. And here's the other thing I learned in New York. I said, New Yorker, always, I said, what do you do if someone approaches you? He said, get in a trash can. And I said, <laughs> what? Jump in a trash can? He said, get in a trash can and act crazy. He said, if they think you're crazy, <laughs> they'll leave you alone. <laughs> wow. He yeah, said, how crazy them. <laughs> And, and I said, okay. And I said, well, what if there's no trash can? He said, you're in New York. There's always a trash can. So just piles of trash. <laughs> he said, you know, how you, you know the, the typical New York greeting, right? How to say hi in New York? How? What are you looking at? Uh, yeah, yeah. You talking to me? Yeah. <laughs> what are you looking at? I'll be there Monday and Tuesday. It's, not, it's typically not as clean as that, but it's usually yeah. got enough word in it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, New York is a wonderful place. It's yeah. a great, great place to learn. And it's a great place to carve out your niche as a writer. Mm-hmm. I studied under so many novelists there, and it was really great. And everybody you saw, everybody you run into, they were a story. So, right. Well, know. tell us about your, um, we both are do some speaking. Yeah. Um, what is your platform? What do you talk about? Um, one of the things, I use humor, very obviously. Yeah. And uh, one of the things I, usually my platform has some form or fashion of grabbing your dreams and doing it and not staying safe. Um, and basically, one, one, of my, one of my speaking topics is sometimes you need an outboard motor. People are thinking, okay, I'm a sailboat. I'm a sailboat. I am only meant to sail. I have my sails. What if there's no wind? What do you do? Always have a plan B. Put an outboard motor in and go somewhere else. You know, in my life, if you lose a job, if you lose a job, you can let that maroon you forever because I am a, mm. you know, I am a radio personality and, and I now, and I've lost my job. Therefore, I can never work unless I'm a radio personality. There might be 15 other jobs that come your way. You have 26 backup plans. Yeah. You have, well, you have, 20, yeah. you have 26 skill sets. Jim has 26 skill sets. Um, yeah, I almost feel like any of these things that, that I do, um, I could do full time. And, yeah. and the funny thing is, is, in the radio business, you are absolutely right. There are so many people in that business that are just so myopic. They don't, you know. That's I, a I, really I, good word. I just mm-hmm. can't do anything else. It's like, what do what, you really? I had a conversation with a guy the other day, and we we're trying to figure out ways to achieve his mm-hmm. dominant focus. Uh, like a, a certain thing that he wanted to achieve in 2018. And I said, okay, well, he wanted to get back in the voiceover. Yeah. And I said, well, what else can you do? We, we started branching off. I said, you, you have a little bit of background in audio production, right? He goes, yeah. yeah. I said, okay, we branch off his dominant focus of, I think it was like 75 a year. And I said, mm-hmm. voiceover is one way to get there. 
He toured with um, a, a pretty big artist, mm -hmm. and that was that was coming to as a end. musician, as a front of house guy. Okay, so he had, he had that strength. He had that set of skills, and then all we said we had like four different ways yeah. he could make revenue streams. And then all of a sudden he's like, I said, what what kind of rig are you using for your production? And he goes, Oh, I just built a uh, blah blah blah. I said, Wait 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 wait. What you built it? Yes. He goes, Yeah, I built computers. I go, Hello, fifth revenue stream, dude. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. That's how people need to start thinking. You think that way because you don't know what way. And I'm I'm a very much a believer in divine plans. Sure. And your divine plan might be trying to bless you in a way that you weren't prepared. Mm -hmm. That you're going to miss if you keep. And I love the word myopic. That's going to be one of my new favorite words. You're welcome. You, Tunnel you're, you're thinking there in that little spot, and you go, "I can only be this." And this blessing over here, blessing yeah. over here, blessings come see us. You know. But you also have to be. Aware enough to recognize the yeah. universe trying to tell you something. Exactly, exactly. And your universe will tell you, uh, I believe God will tell you sure. that, you know, it's like a lightning bolt. When you are lined up, when you're in your path to your source, I mean, it starts happening. You go, man, this is so easy. Mm -hmm. You know? I've been this before. Yeah. And, you know, and I. I had this wonderful uh, dream one time, and, and I felt like it was a Holy Spirit voice that said, I will not bless what I do not ordain. And I think about all the doors that have shut for me over the years mm. when things got really, really tough. Mm. You know, sometimes we get told, I've got something better for you. But we keep hitting our head against the bad door. I don't, I don't see doors ever closing for you. Oh, you know, they've closed. They've closed in different times. But all it did was like a river changes course doesn't stop the river it just changes the direction a little bit because and then that river gets to see all sorts of new shoreline yeah new things you know you get to move and, and see new things and do new things it's like wow how did i get here i'm always asking myself how did i get here this yeah. is cool thank you well you're so open mm -hmm. and, 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 and and now if you're brave <laughs> enough to to try something new and be willing to even suck at it oh that's it be willing to fail. fail. Be willing to fail. You know, you know, I took eight years of ballet. I'm not a ballet dancer. It was the greatest time of my life. I love ballet. I love to dance. I love, love, love it. Was I great at it? No, I failed horribly. My teacher told me, they said, there's one guy and me, and he said, you light, you don't land. You know, <laughs> I would leap. And, it wasn't my thing, yeah. but every day I use some of those movements, yeah. and I go, okay, maybe I wasn't supposed to become a ballet dancer. I was supposed to use that later in my life, right. and have a great. Don't be afraid to fail, and don't be afraid to try. Mm. There's a blessing in every failure. Yeah, mm. always. Yeah, I'm, I, I think it's really important to not only keep up with the Joneses, but you, I mean, you you have to uh, just be uncomfortable. I mean, I am more, I'm getting more and more comfortable, but not as comfortable getting copy, creating a character, memorizing, being, doing this. I've been playing the drums for 30 something years. Mm -hmm. This whole, this other thing is new, but it's so scary and fresh and exciting. But when I succeed at it, oh my God, it feels so good. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know? It really is. Yeah. And, and you know what? And, and being brave is something you don't know that you are that until you face the scariest thing you've ever done yeah you know if, if fear keeps everybody from being brave but you never know you can you can talk about courage and faith all you want to but until you've been in a place where you don't have any other choice do you know you have those tools right bravery just comes out of the the worst things you know yeah it always does yeah you know somebody says you've got cancer guess what you become brave really quickly you become brave overnight. Everybody in your family becomes brave because they put on the brave face. That's Life is like that. You yeah. don't have any guarantees. It's a difference between have to and want to. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that was my story. I lost a job and I had to come out swinging or we go down. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, I, and it was, here I am. Mm -hmm. Our friend Hal Bowman is a great speaker. He teaches like a rock star. talks about it. The difference between have to and want to all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We have yeah. a good, good buddy. Hal. It's funny because you are loaded up. Like someone should be, should be doing those meme pictures. You've got like I'm, I'm writing all the stuff like 
It's, it's a, you got to find the, the the blessing and the failure, or what you said. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that's a, it's a really good quote. Oh, <laughs> thank you. And those are in your speaking events. Now, yeah. who's, now, uh, who is who are your audiences that you're speaking to? I mean, it could be anybody. I mean, sometimes. I mean, I've spoken to you know board of realtors, and I've spoken to yeah. uh, pregnancy centers across America. You know, and you know, it, it doesn't matter. I, I did a convention for cafeteria school workers. Mm-hmm. Uh, school cafeteria workers I'll get that right in the right uh, <laughs> anyway it doesn't matter because people are people and all people need to know that they have value all people have to know that I matter in this big scheme of life that I have some kind of special calling and I tailor it to who they are mm-hmm. and usually I tell them why they're important because we live in a world that constantly tells us that if you're not this and you're not this you are not important mm-hmm. You're not famous, therefore you're not important. Well, guess what? That school cafeteria worker who makes sure that that kid who's not going to have a meal from Friday at lunch until Monday morning at breakfast, that happens in this country. One in four children don't get a meal. Yes, one in four children are... uh, Don't eat on Saturday or Sunday? have, ...have food insecurity. So that cafeteria school worker is the last face they see of nurturing, giving them food. Mm. And that's how important that is. So let me tell you, these people that we're heroes. They're they're heroes. heroes. heroes, And 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 then they look and so now they've created these programs of backpack programs. Second Harvest does an amazing one, so the kids get to pick up. Now the cafeteria worker packs a a a a little backpack and these particular kids For the weekend. For the weekend. And things that they can make themselves because mom and dad, and not because mom and dad are starving them, because mom and dad are having a tough time because there's just not that. Or maybe they don't even live within walking distance and they don't have a car to a grocery store. So, I mean, that's an example of some of the people that need to know how important they are. Yeah. You know, and people that you might go, I mean, famous people, I, I dare say there are people like the Kardashians who have this immense fame. Mm. And some of the least important people in the planet. Yeah, the, you know, are you doing something that's going to change the life of everyone for the better? Mm-hmm. You know, that one cafeteria worker probably change, changes more lives every week than mm-hmm. all of the careers of some of the famous people that you yeah. know. Fame and notoriety are very, very interesting things. Mm-hmm. I love that. I love that you tailor your message. I try to do the same thing because it's way better to have a universal message than just, you know, I swam uh, the English Channel or I climbed Mount Everest, and they, they, they don't change their speech. It's the same thing every time. So it's really great that you ta- tailor the message. I love that. Well, I mean, it's important, and but you have, and you, you use your experience. I use my experience. Mm-hmm. Our experiences don't change. But when you apply them to other people's lives, that's where this, the message changes. Yeah. And you're able to take drumming and the things that you've learned with Crash and that whole setup yeah. applies to any human being that's ever walked if they never hold a drumstick except at KFC. So thank you, Hal Bowman. My <laughs> buddy Hal Bowman helped me come up with that. You know what I came up with a new uh, acronym? <laughs> what? It's called the POWER concept. Oh. It stands for people. Hold on. Let's see if I can remember it. People, opportunity, opportunity, work ethic, work ethic, execution. I, I guess I didn't remember it. Rhythm. So pe- <laughs> everything in life is about people creating opportunities together, driving it home with hard work, a work ethic, executing, which a lot of oh. people talk the talk, but they never execute, which makes the big difference between success mm-hmm. and non-success, and getting into a rhythm and repeating this cycle throughout oh, your life. So it's the that's so good. And the fact that you put it in an acronym, easy to remember, making things easy to remember, you know, yeah. and it goes in, it goes in better, you know, putting things to, and this is some of the things that I do when I do my copy. I put, I have a rhythm yeah. to every every piece of copy, and I make it musical. Like mm-hmm. uh, if if I do a little song to a phone number, people remember it better. Yeah, yeah, like uh, what. Um What's the carpet company? One eight hundred Empire. Empire. Yeah. <laughs> There's a little thing at the end. <laughs> Boom. Um, I remember. Questions. I remember one, like two commercials. I I had to put back when I got in the radio. I was the guy that always did the dub ins. You know. Uh huh. Yeah. So you had to put the dubs in. Um, uh, there was a um, there was a company up in Connecticut. It was. Um, of course, I don't remember what it was for now, but I remember the phone number because of a song. You got to yeah, take your Ginkgo Balboa, man. I know Ginkgo Balboa. Hey, 
Yeah. <laughs> hey, do we have any specific questions? No specific questions. Just people checking in. And how are we doing on time? Enjoying. We're doing it. We're pushing it out. We got a really busy person here. I mean, can't um, take up her whole day. I'm 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 a buzz. Like you're making almost bringing me the tears. I'm just I'm just very very inspired. Um, I just it's always nice to to meet another successful person that does a lot of things because you do get a lot of people that say, "Look at man, you need to laser focus. You need to do one thing uh, and you need to drive it home for the rest of your life." And I get that. I I feel like I'm so glad that I be became an expert, I guess, um, at my instrument. Of course, that's never ending. But that that experience um, gives me the right to do other things. You know, okay, you know, those, the people who say just do one thing and do it well, yeah. that makes me so angry. Yeah. Because everyone is gifted in so many different ways. Right. Why in the world would you neglect some of the other things you, that give you joy? Yeah. You know, why would you neglect those things just because somebody else said, there's that old phrase, uh, you know, uh, jack, jack of, of all, all trades, trades, master of none. Well, guess what? I can be a jack of all trades that I enjoy and like, and I can be a master at every one that I choose to be a master at. I, love it. I can be better. It makes there for is a busy day. A very, yeah. People are like, I don't know how you do this, dude. I'm like, yeah, it's exhausting, but uh, we have a good time. Yeah. You, know. you go, okay, you know what? Oh. I'll do an audio book. It's like I'm, I'm on a deadline for two right now. Right. And so every morning, I mean, I'm up very early. I leave. I go do my session. Then I run, go to the radio station. But I read for three hours, you know, and I do about 65 pages in three hours. Nice. And am I fast? No. I'm accurate because I practice. And people go, well, how do you get good at that? Okay, do you have books at your house? Mm -hmm. Newspaper? Read them. Read them out loud. Out How long. long can you go without making a mistake? Yeah. Then you're an audio book. Are you doing your own editing too? Or no, no, my lord, no. That would slow things down. Yeah. Same thing no. I do here, like at the studio here at Crash mm -hmm. Studio. So I have a session coming in at five o'clock. So I pay an engineer and I have a, a producer coming in. This is rare with the drummer from the rock band. So they're going to mm -hmm. record. He's got to pick from any of these drums. And then I have the engineer because if I had to record myself and edit myself, it would slow everything down. Yeah. I would rather surround myself with people that have extreme time and talent and yes. pay them for their time and talent uh -huh. and then execute on more things. Then That's then how you can do more than one thing. Exactly. Because, you know, Rita Davenport, another great speaker, wonderful woman, uh, find her work, look at it. Uh, one of the things I learned from her about time management, uh, you might like to mow your yard, but are you an expert at mowing your yard? No. But while you're taking five hours, there's a guy down the street so, who's an expert. Yep. He does it, and then you're like that. And then it op it opens up your day. You've got that extra three hours, and what can you do in three hours? Well, you know what? I can read 65 pages of an audio book. I can book a show. I can... I love it. I, in three hours, I can write a song. I think lawn care, maids, and um, dry cleaners are worth every penny. Because the time and energy yeah. you save by not doing those things, you could do all these other things. And those people are experts in their field. They're and experts. Guess what? You let them do what they're gifted at. Yes. And you bless, the more people you bless by letting the experts in their fields do their work, yep. you get to be an expert in your field. And don't be a bad tipper, America. That's right. God, that we me. learned that from Jerry Seinfeld. Always an exorbitant <laughs> tipper. Oh, he, he, well, he that episode where he goes... Uh, uh, some oh, Seth Meyers just left the tip, uh -huh. and and Seinfeld goes, "Did what kind of a tip did you leave? It, it, was it a good tip? He goes, yeah, it was good. He goes, was it an entertainment showbiz tip? In other words, you know, you can't have Jerry Seinfeld coming in and in, and having lunch and have him just do twenty percent. Yeah, okay. Because someone's going to be like, dude, Seinfeld came in, he's worth millions. He left me twenty percent. I mean, he got to leave, needs to leave a hundred percent. He's you know at least I'm sure. Don't you? Yeah. I don't know, man. You know, I don't I mean, know, man. Uh, it's like you know, twenty percent is. I don't know. I, I, I think I, you know, if when I come, I mean, I, I, getting I back to radio, it, I would assume it would be a hundred percent tip. Getting back to radio, which looking back on it, being a production director most of my time, uh -huh. I should have put a tip jar in my studio for all the clients that came in and got a kick out of how I was able to produce spots. Yeah, like oh my gosh, how do you do that? And it's like there's, there's a tip jar right there. Just, yeah. See, that would have been a great idea. Right. <laughs> that it's like playing been... piano. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's that brings me to another point. Know your value, yeah, know and your value. do not be afraid to ask for what you are worth. That's the thing that's taken me the longest time to learn it. Yeah. But because I go, oh no, that's okay. The people say, how much do you charge? And I go, oh, well, you know, what do you pay? I mean, I, I'll work with your budget and everything. Mm-hmm. You know, people will pay as little as you will let them. So you say, this is what I normally get, mm-hmm. and then they, and then you let them say what they want, mm-hmm. and then, okay, we really really want you, but can we can only do this. You that's say, that's yeah. the value proposition. That's where you know, you know what, I, I, I want to work with you. I'm free that yeah. day. Mm-hmm. And voiceover people are bad at that. And I teach a lot of that to people. Voiceover people are all, but you know what, everybody's bad. But you know who's not bad? The electric company. Yeah. They know exactly <laughs> what they charge. So I think about that. I've learned. I go, you know what, I'm like the electric company. And if you're going to be a speaker, people want you to speak. And they, go, you know, and they go, another big thing is, well, it's a nonprofit. You know, and they're selling tickets, obviously. And if it's and it's okay. I mean, if it's your cause and your nonprofit, there's some nonprofits I will never charge for because mm-hmm. they're my. I would be donating it right back to them. Mm-hmm. But if it's not my thing, and I look and I go, okay, you're buying liquor because there's an open bar. You're paying for. There are a thousand people that are going to be at this gala. Mm-hmm. They've all paid money, and you're paying for the food. And you're paying for this beautiful room. You gotta pay the speaker. Pay the speaker. Let's say fifty cents every ticket for a thousand people goes to the speaker. A dollar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> say, give me a dollar for every person coming. Oh, do you in. do that? Or what I, what I start okay. thinking in terms of every ticket as a speaker when they say, What is your rate? Um, I'll give them my rate and I then I learned how to break it down. I say, Well, I'm much less than your catering bill and I know I'm less than your liquor bill. Mm-hmm. So, so even though, so with nonprofits, I have, I have one coming up in April or March, and I'm giving them the super friend rate. But mm-hmm. it is a nonprofit. And I'm, you know, I'm covering for someone else that got booked. And I said, well, I'll cover for you. And it's like, look at, like my mother said, you know, Rich, never complain about what you're getting paid because I have been a career nurse for 40 years. Right. And I've been covered in blood and urine and people dying on me every second of every day to make, I think a, a good nurse can make like $300 a day. That's a, that's a, 14 hour shift that it's that it's They're, unbelievable I'm like you know what, what? our nurses go you're right. through you're right what our uh, teachers go through every day well, teachers this is oh. a travesty this is yeah. an absolute like let's get political teachers don't get paid enough they're responsible for our kids ouch but they and did then, make the decision to go into it knowing full well what it paid I know why it's like it, a radio person but why does it pay more we need to pay athletes less and teachers more because Okay. An American can team. they capitalize on their other skill sets to help supplement their income? Sure. Okay. Yeah, they, they can. They can. Yep. Absolutely. All right. They're, okay, I'm thinking about that. Okay. In the three months they have off. Okay, or two months. But you're right. I mean, and I think I I, I agree with you. I think the athletes eh, should be paid a little bit less. Ooh. Entertainment people a little um, bit less. Getting back to what you're saying about people not knowing, like. You know, starting with a book, start reading a book, start, mm-hmm. you know, how do I do this? You know, do you find that you come across people that they're just not aware of how to pursue something and not aware of the different ways they can start? Or do they, are they really good at making excuses typically? I think people are extremely great at making excuses. When I tell people you have to practice every day, they go, no, but how did you do it? And I point out now there was a time, every day. I, you know, I go, I do four mailings a year to all the people that do voiceover work. You know, now I don't do that anymore because everything's electronic, so I don't do mailings every year. But I get in touch with four times a year. I go through all of my list and I refine it, and I get in touch with those people and say, "By the way, I'm still here. I still want to do work." When I tell, and they say, well, "Where did you?" I've had people say, "Well, would you give me your contact list?" And I go, "No." Wow, your what? contact list? Who would say that? Over and over and over, and I'm going, get the yellow pages. It's your contact list that you Look cultivated for, one handshake at a time. I said, you know, go to, the, go to the yellow pages or Google production houses for commercials, advertising agencies, mm-hmm. ask for the create. Well, no, but I don't want to do all that. What, how do I just get the list? And I go, that's how I got my list. Yeah. I'm not, well, how much could, I, could you pay me? I said, see... Uh, thirty-five thousand a year for ten. Okay, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I kind of look as like, how much time have I devoted to this? How many hours do I devote to this? Sure. You can't pay me enough for me to give you my list. See, the other aspect of that is the voiceover industry has been going through a dramatic shift, and mm-hmm. a lot of voiceover people I know, and I, I kind of speak against this, mm-hmm. 
get very upset with the race to the bottom that's been going on with all the pay to play sites that are out there and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, stop wasting your freaking energy on complaining about these sites and start learning how to sell yourself. Learn a sales process. Mm -hmm. Well, you can have the yeah. greatest skill set in the world. We talk about it all the time. But if no one knows you exist, mm -hmm. you have to shout from them. Exist and know how to sell. To cut mm -hmm. through the noise. And I got so much flack. A decade ago, oh my gosh! For Facebook, I got on Facebook and I just said, you know what? This is the future. Mm -hmm. I am going to tell people once a day what I am doing. Yeah, and never miss a day. And it's just, it, it, it's great. That's how where I get my business. It is how I get my business too, Rich. And it is social media. I mean, back when it was MySpace, I said, there's something happening with platforms and networking that this is revolutionary. We have got to, and, and I, I mean, I remember people close to me saying, you just spend so much, that's just, those are just time bandits. Nope. No, you know what? You can write a lot of books, but nobody's going to give you a publishing deal if you don't have your platforms fleshed out and you don't have enough followers because the first thing they say is how many followers do you have how many followers yeah. do you have who's going to buy your book oh, what's your engagement yeah, yeah. but now time bandits are is playing candy crush that is a time bandit. Yeah. but pet rescue <laughs> saga teaches me everything i need to know about life <laughs> but even you know, you know house of cards marathons and stuff like that yeah that's all the stuff that vaynerchuk talks about stop wasting your time and start dominating and letting people know what it is that you do. Let people yeah. know uh, and and learn how to multitask and yeah. do what you do. You know, if you um, if you pay attention, I think if you find a show that you're just all of a sudden you're into that show, you use it. I don't watch television without a notebook there because ideas come from mm. that. Whether it's a philosophy, I'm going okay. God, what am I supposed to be enriching my brain with today? And it might be the show Blue Bloods. Yeah. I've learned so much from that show. Yeah. It's so awesome. Mm -hmm. And I, I go, wow, I'm really supposed to be getting this right now because every, looking back down my list, I go, I'm supposed to know everything that's on this list today. Mm -hmm. And everything I got was from Blue Bloods. You know, if you're going to watch something and you're going to binge watch something, allot your time. I now set a clock to go to bed. I don't usually have to set. The binging is, is a new thing. It's, yeah, it's a whole yeah. Thing. I, I set a clock to go to bed because sleep is really important. Because sleep is where I get all my greatest ideas. Yeah. that's where you dream. Mm. Mm. This has been so good today. It's been very good. Very good. So, so like I've been watching uh, the Godfather series. Over okay. Again. And I'm thinking the thing I'm taking from that is how to creatively persuade people by scaring them. <laughs> You should do that. The horse head and all that. Yeah. Right? yeah. See? Very, really good. Yeah. See, so I'm just trying been. to think, in closing, is there any little <laughs> nugget of wisdom that you would want to share with people about <clears throat> the music I've got business? an entire page of nuggets of wisdom that I've been writing down. Oh, I'm just, I'm just awesome. to, like, to, to, you know, to, to leave our list, is there, is there, to leave our listeners with any tidbits about music motivation or success to take with them is there anything that you're working on that you would like to just tell us about you know one of the things that is usually the takeaway and everybody says it is when I speak to them is I say write real talk real be real mm -hmm. and whatever that thing that is in, intrinsically part of you writing real the best songs that are written are not those that come out of a test tube they came out of a real life experience, experience. Amen. when you write a book and you can call it fiction all you want but mm -hmm. you better have lived something yeah. write real and be real when until you can find your authentic self you are never going to be happy right. and you will never be successful if you're not happy I don't care if you have money I don't care if you've achieved if you don't have peace and happiness in your life you are not successful yeah. so examine your life and you go I'm stressed I'm not having fun I'm just you're not successful yet mm. success comes out of the joy and the peace of when it's like yeah this is what contentment feels like even it's though like, you're hustling so hard even though you're hustling that it hard doesn't feel like it. it doesn't feel like it because you you know that you know that you know yeah. I am exactly where I'm supposed to be at exactly the right time and that time is now that is the place where you go okay this is it I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing yeah I mean you you feel that way yeah I do feel that way and you do too I feel that way yeah uh -huh. it, it gets it gets like it does get exhausting like uh -huh. doing as many things as we do yeah but 
When um, you let money start driving you, is that a problem? If I'm sorry? When you let money start to drive you, though. Money creates, um, and I believe that everybody deserves to make a a. Uh, you need to make abundance. as much as you can abundance and I believe it's all out there yeah. but when you search for that in desperation it will always elude you always elude you you so, can work very hard but if you are focused on I'm doing this because I feel called to do it and you create ways to be paid for what you're called to do mm -hmm. create your revenue streams that's you, the revenue streams how can we create inflow for this thing that I'm outflowing inflow for the outflow mm -hmm. that's man it's huge it's huge and you go wow it might be creating a website I can't tell you how many people are out there and they go I want to be a professional well do you have a website well no okay well, it's too expensive you got to get it done. I mean, it's what, eight bucks on GoDaddy to get your domain, and then well, you can. You can build it yourself. With yes. A template, with a template. I do it all the time. Yeah. I, you know, and, and it takes a little time, yeah, but you have to invest in yourself. You have invest to invest in yourself. Yes, that's it, all the time. Mm -hmm. I love it. And, uh, and, and make sure you surround yourself with people who love you in your real, raw state. And if they're, if I, I call it fair weathers. So it, it, so you know when you when you get a new gig and you're out on the road and stuff, man. Hey, how you doing? You know, I can. Hey, can you hook me up? You know. Uh uh. Can you give me tickets? Yeah. You, how many times? How many times? Yeah. And when you're down, the people that you can count on your hand on, on, on usually one hand. People you know, always say the old joke. He'll show up at two in the morning to get you out of jail. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, yeah. I mean that uh, Harry Warner. God bless him. He uh, from BMI years ago said, you know, it's the it's the people that'll get you out of jail at two in the morning. You Those, know, you find out who your friends are. Yeah, yeah. you find or out who your friends are. are yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. So, so, being that you were in a choir with Tim McGraw, did you ever go, hey Tim, hey, you know, I got a song. All the time, <laughs> all the time. You know, and Tim McGraw reminds everyone. Well, she was way ahead of me in school. I was not. <laughs> He's my fraternity brother too. We were both in Pi Kappa Alpha. I was a little sister, and he was uh, he was a little behind me. Right. But, it's just a small world. So it cool. is a very small world. Trace Atkins went to the school down the road at Tech, where my father went. Yeah, so. Trace is doing a good job with his acting and his voiceover for the. He's another Renaissance Renaissance guy, yeah. and he is so smart. He really is, and he, but he's authentically him. You meet Trace out anywhere. The only thing he doesn't show out in his professional is he's just a marshmallow. If anybody is going to shed a tear over a song or a person or talk about, we, he and I, uh, along with Tracy Lawrence and um, Wade Hayes, a group of us, uh, Daryl Singletary, we all lost a friend in Kenny Beard. Mm -hmm. We were all at his funeral. And yeah. big old Trace was over there just... You know, I, you know, yeah. yeah, we lost him, and and you know, Trace is one of those kind of guys you see, you go, oh, you gentle know, giant. yeah, gen he's uh, a gentle giant. He definitely is. He's a marshmallow. Yeah, <laughs> I tell the yeah. story in, in in my speeches all the time about you know a bit, having a good attitude and being willing to. I say, guys, I am willing to play quarter notes every other measure on a tambourine. I was doing a session for Trace Atkins and I told my mom, and my, you sound good on that new Trace, I hear your tambourine in the back. It was literally, it was just like, Rich, I want you to play on beat four of every other measure. So it's like, <laughs> And I said, because I'm willing to do that, $100, $200, $300, you know what I'm saying? So, it's yeah. a, so Trace Atkins is in my speech, so that's good. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, there is another example of a well-timed percussive hit, and that Working Man Blues, Merle Haggard. Oh, yeah. da 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 da, -da. Ding. <laughs> it's, like a, it's like an anvil or something. Yeah. Like as a working class guy. Or yeah. Like a hammer or something. Yeah, and I don't even know what they used in the studio to do that, but they're a percussion guy, yep. and you can't hear that song without hearing that, and it's not on the beat. It's in a, they're arbitrary. Yeah. You know, if you try to do it right with it, it's like, what? I'll have to re-listen you know? yeah. Oh, re -li okay. Then you go, okay. And 100, <laughs> 200. <laughs> it's funny that, that there's like little songs melodically embedded. There's a Harry Chapin song uh -huh. similar to that where, and I'm trying to think of the name of the song, but it's about a guy who worked in 
you know, not doing what he was made to do, always just wanted to sing. Yeah. And then, you know, he'd, someone told him you should really go ahead and sing. And every time a Harry Chapin song, the hook, the, the chorus went mm. over, it was him singing underneath the chorus. And like oh. for years, my wife and I would listen to the song. It always, he was, it always sounded like he was just singing a song, yeah. whatever, random. He's singing um, um, the Christmas song, Fall on Your Knees. A Holy Night. A Holy Night. He's, and I, all of a sudden, my, it's my, my wife had no idea. She introduced me to Harry Chapin. And all of a sudden, I'm listening and I'm tuning into that song. Yeah. I'm like, do you know what he's singing? Yeah. And she goes, no. I said, he's singing A Holy Night. And that's one of her favorite Christmas songs, Niagara Falls. I mean, she um, just started bawling mm. because it, it just, I mean, all, the melodic just matched mm. brilliance. It was like, boom. Yeah. Mind blown. <laughs> there are those special but, moments in songs that really make yeah. it, you know. Yeah. But Harry, but yeah, yeah. if you're familiar with that Harry Chapin song, mm -hmm. see, listen to it. It's amazing. Right. Mm -hmm. What's the best ways for, uh, for people um, to find you on the web? Uh, DevonOday.net. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah, I do have a website. Is it the little. On the O? No, okay. no, Devin O'Day, <laughs> and uh, all of my contact information is there. Or listen every day, 3 to 6 p.m., Monday through Friday at 6.50 a.m. You can find it on the web. You can stream it live at wsmonline.com or a handy-dandy listening app, the 6.50 a.m. WSM official listening app, app, available at iTunes and Google Play. I love it. See, she, I know, she's done it before. It's like your professional and stuff. <laughs> I know. It's crazy. Well, the, the night. <laughs> years with Jerry House and then now the yeah the and I must tell you he taught me everything he was great about radio yeah. his work ethic he was funny but let me tell you what it was really hard work and he taught me that you could do more than one thing because he was great songwriting at well. songwriting and he would leave and he'd write a show and then he would go and write songs and then would go home and record the show for the next day mm. and I mean you know, that sure. worked, but I watched him. And when, and then he would write comedy and he'd write stage shows for Reba McIntyre. He wrote comedy for Roseanne Barr. He wrote, and he never, when he taught me so much about being a Renaissance person, because he he's an amazing piano player. Oh, yeah. I mean, amazing. Yeah. He plays guitar and he writes. You know, and, and and I asked him when he wrote his book, Country Music Broke My Brain, and I he said. I uh, didn't love that process as much, you know, because it's hard. Long form is hard, and then you have this thing called an editor. Book writing is so different. I'm in the middle of yeah. two right now with two different co-authors, and oh, I don't, I don't I'm feel sorry. like I'm making. <laughs> I, I don't feel like I'm making any effort, but we will get it out. It's just, a, it's just a big process. It's a big process. You know? It's a long process, and and if, I wish I had a nickel for everybody that says, "Hey, I've got an idea for a book. I'll give you the idea. You write it, and we split the proceeds." And I'm going, "Are you kidding me? No. Yeah. The hardest part is finishing." Right. And that is the other thing is as the best advice I can get, give anyone is to finish what you start. Mm -hmm. Always finish. Unless you just find that you just hate it. And then you go, okay, don't waste another minute on something that you hate. But don't hold on to something that you love and just not finish it. Yeah. Finish what you start that you love. I love that. Wow. This wonderful, sweet lady, I ask her name. She's Her name is Fran, and she's 85 years old. And I said, Fran, what's your secret to longevity? She said, find ever, whatever it is you love to do. And do it a lot. Mm. Isn't that awesome? It's just 85. You know, it's like, find ever, whatever you love to do and do it a lot. Oh, I'm man. drinking a milkshake every day then. <laughs> a milkshake <laughs> every day and I think, ooh, you know. Oh, I guess we're going to wrap it up. I, okay. I mean, we could just go for days because you're just so delightful, but it's just been so awesome having you. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Well, I love you more than lunch and jewelry. I love you. Um, at, ladies and gentlemen, Devin O'Day, <laughs> uh, be sure to uh, tune in here. Uh, all these other episodes are archived at richredmond.com. That's R-E-D-M-O-N-D. -E of course, we're on iTunes, we're on Google Play, we're on Stitcher, and the webcast is on YouTube. Yep. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We'll see you soon. Bye.